Hello. Um, I don't see Darren back in the auditorium. I just wanted to tell him the right way to hold a mic is um, this way. <laughs> um, sagging the pants. Ho hopefully that works for this presentation. If, if nothing else, if this doesn't work, I'm going to resort to rapping. I'll, I'll make it up. I'll make it up. <laughs> um, a <laughs> little bit. Well, also, another disclaimer is this is the first time I'm doing this particular talk, so it may not be as polished as Darren's was. Um, but that being said, I mean, the title of this talk kind of says all that it needs to, right? The point of this is we, we have a very red team focused infosec space um, at, at, at present. I mean, you've, you've got the pen tester guys who are all like rock stars and these guys are cool, they've got O days and t-shirts and all that fun stuff and like nobody wants to be in, in, in the blue team anymore, right? Um, and, and I think what I really want to try and achieve in this talk is, is to kind of show that, you know what, uh, blue teaming can kind of be just as sexy as, as the red team stuff was, right? Yeah? Yeah? Any, anyway, um, so just to give you a little history about myself other than the stuff that's on the screen is I, I used to be a pen tester, right? Um, and strangely enough, a lot of people actually start off in the blue team and go toward red team type stuff. And I, I was in the red team and I've moved toward blue team type stuff. Um, and a lot of this started actually when I just started my red team career. Um, I was working for one of the banks. Um, and they sent me to a security conference and I met, I seen this guy who was giving a talk, this freaking infosec quack, um, Haroon something or the other, I don't know, <laughs> guy. Anyway, but if you guys uh, haven't seen any of Haroon's talks, he often does this talk about why <laughs> infosec folk suck, right? Like why we're bad at our jobs. And he always starts off this thing by saying like, okay, anyone in the room who thinks that your CEO is unreachable by a targeted attacker, put your hand up. And then nobody puts their hand up. And we're sitting in a room with like usually what is like all the hackers in any particular business. And he says, well, you guys are so clever, then why not, right? And this was the, the premise of his talk. Um, and at the time, I mean, I was, I was in the red team. I was a pen tester. I was like all bright eyed and bushy tailed. And I thought to myself, you know what? Come on, man. Like, the fact that you can get to my CEO has nothing to do with whether I suck. It's that guy, that freaking dude in the room over there, and that dude with white t-shirt, and like, it's his fault. He didn't patch the thing, you know. I, I found the vulnerability. I told them where the problems are. They must fix it. It's their problem, right? Um, and, and that's why I started off in, at InfoSec, and I actually think that carries on quite far into... Um, like the natural career progression. We all start off as blue team people and then as we get better, we're like, oh no, now I wanna be a hacker, right? Um, and that, that's actually what made me decide eventually to leave doing red teaming, blue team, uh, red team type stuff. And so I used to be a pen tester and I decided one day after doing a pen test at a, at a firm for the third year in a row, finding the same vulnerabilities on their web front end, I thought to myself, you know what, I could do a better job at this guy's job than he can. Like, and, and that's what actually led me to start um, blue team type stuff. And I think just, just to set the scene for the, this particular talk, let, let's talk about like, isn't defense sexy already, right? And so we'll start with the red versus blue comparison. And so the red team guys, I mean, they've got like logos and art designers and vulnerabilities and exploits with cool names and like CVEs and bug bounties that they get paid for. And on the complete flip side, it's like, look at the blue team stuff, right? We, we've got like vendor issues. Um, <laughs> we've, got, we've got some maps with lines that go from one side to the other in every sock. It's like pew, and actually there, there is one that makes pew pew sounds. Um, so you, you guys have all seen that cybersecurity map where you've got like you can see attacks going across the world. There's one specifically with pew pew sounds as the attacks are going across. <laughs> like someone thought this was a cool idea, you know? Um, and I mean, okay, look, I, I'm, I'm not gonna comment about whether dark trace is effective or not, but it's the only thing I can think of that is pretty. Have you seen the user interface? Like, oh, 
I, I think they spend most of their R&D time on that user interface, right? T totally, totally, right? Uh, and I think a sin becomes a thing, right? I don't think cybersecurity is actually sexy, right? I, th I think the industry as a whole, I mean, we're, we're like either two red team or on the blue team side, we're like two vendor, okay? Uh, uh, not not like vendor and cause I mean like like vendor <laughs> right um, and, and I think the thing is if you look at the blue teams generally like if just quick show of hands guys in the blue team quickly um, okay keep your hands up just keep your hands up for a second put your hands down if your manager is more technical than you right see the problem Right? And, and, and this is, this is going to be my second quack story, right? Is that I, I actually used to report to this guy um, who set the strategy for, for, for defense and cybersecurity um, at, at a bank, no less. Um, and this guy had the freaking dumbest story I've heard along. His whole cybersecurity strategy was this, right? Nine out of ten times. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Ninety percent of the time. So I kid you not, this is what he said, right? Hackers use Linux. And I thought, okay, cool story, bro. Like, where, where are we going with this? Um, and, and he said, so if we use NAC and we block Linux on the network, 90% <laughs> of your problems are gone, right? <laughs> and and I, looked at, I looked the dude square in the eye and I thought to myself, you know what, guys, I'm, I'm resigning today. That was, that was literally what happened. And, and that was the first of two times that I resigned from this organization within a three-month window, but we're, we're not going to go there, right? And I think the other thing to, to remember here is that, like, these statistics just seem to be made up. But, you know, infosec quacks, right? And, and this is a problem. Cybersecurity just isn't sexy, right? We've, we're not getting that balance right. Um, and if we look at our current... Um, cybersecurity strategy, right? We've, we've got a couple of things here, right? Right? I mean, it's 2018. CLI tools, I mean, uh, as powerful as they are, guys, it, it is still 2018, right? I mean, we're, we're, we really can't be affording to bring in, trying to attract new talent in and getting them to sit in front of a 3270 terminal bashing away commands in. This is why all the mainframe people are like past retirement age, right? They're the only people who like this user interface. Like, it's 2018, okay? Um, I, 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 don't even, I don't even know where to go with this, right? I, 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 actually, no, but we're just going to move forward from this particular point here. Um, too, too much effort, right? Um, not fit for purpose, right? I mean, like, guys, how many times have you, again, show of hands, um, your line manager has come back from some security conference and he's like, guys, got new report, freaking demo, it's amazing, we need this thing, right? And they make that decision based on, like, dude, do we want this thing, not does this thing work for us? They, they saw something on a screen somewhere and thought, man, we need this thing, not guy, what do we need, and then go out and look for that thing. No, 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 that's not how these, these purchasing decisions work. Um, and before I get to the next slide, I'm going to tell you another quack story before I explain the, the, next, the next slide, right? Is that I, I work at Investec, um, and this is where I met the third quack, right? But the, this particular guy, one Herman Young, <coughs> he, he said to us, guys, every particular piece of malware that hits our email gateway, I want my incident response team to look at, <laughs> right? Right? So, 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 so the, the team at the time, we had two incident responders and a new guy. I was the new guy. Um, and, and I was like, dude, more quack science. But, but actually, th this is one of those times where I can say, like, two out of three infosec quacks are, like, dumb. And that this guy maybe was onto something. And, and this led us to um, some of the things that you'll, you'll see here in a, a demo that I'll do a little bit later. Um, how much for time? Um, time, we've got, okay, cool. No, we've still got plenty of time. Um, th this is uh, 
just some screenshots of, of two of the things that we've built to try and help us achieve this particular target. And it's actually been an amazing journey getting there, right? Um, the first thing you'll see in the background is actually our malware repo, and, and Investec has built this, and we, we're shared across the um, South African Banking Risk Information Center CSERT working group. And what that is is where all the banks get together, and wherever we find malware, we throw it up here. Um, as soon as we upload the file, the file goes straight to VirusTotal. We get wildfire analysis. We get PCAPs. Um, we get a hybrid analysis report. We use another tool called Intezo, which does attribution. Um, basically, what it does is it disassembles all the code, looks at the code that's used in all of the tools, um, and compares them to each other. So what you can do is you can say malware sample A shares some genetic association with malware sample B because there's some code reuse. Even if you don't know who the person is who wrote A or B, you can tell they're related, right? Um, the other thing that allows you to do is you can say, well, I've only seen this particular code block in malware. So if I see this particular code block somewhere, chances are it must be malware, right? Um, and what we do from here is all of these reports are automatically generated, so we upload these via API. Um, they go straight into the sandbox. The sandbox processes them, and it outputs some IOCs, right? Um, any files dropped, any hashes, um, domains, IP addresses contacted, it outputs that in JSON format. We then suck that in via Splunk, um, and then we constantly monitor our, our environment for that. So if we find a particular host that's contacted a domain, for example, that happens to have appeared on this list, we know there must be some association to a sample which has been uploaded here, even if it's the first time we've seen the sample. So it could have been a sample that's maybe landed at the Standard Bank side, and they've uploaded it to our malware repo, and we've subsequently been hit by it. We'll kind of get the alert, right? Um, the second thing here is this is a screenshot from Telegram. <laughs> Um, this is one of our bots, and I've just given you kind of a sample of like different things that we can do, so commands we can send it. Um, when we get threat intelligence uh, alerts that come out or via our threat intelligence sharing platforms, we can kind of take that particular IP address out and say, dear agent, IP block out traffic to a particular IP, so we stick the IP in and that goes straight to the Palo Altos and within the next... 30-minute window, those, those up, updates are live on our firewall, and none of the hosts on the internal network should be able to access that IP, right? Um, and this whole process of automation is what's actually allowed us to achieve the targets that were set by the third quack in this particular story that I'm sharing. Um, and it was actually just two weeks before Black Hat um, when... Uh, Her Herman was having this meeting at Sabric um, about why the participation is the way it is at Sabric and how do we better share information across banks. And a lot of the banks said, well, you guys have this stuff for the last year and some odd. Um, and actually, we, we don't have these kind of things. We've got different tool sets, different tooling, different capabilities in our environments. And sharing data like this is kind of, it, it's difficult, right? I mean, you guys can look at every malware sample that gets to your gateway and see, is there a targeted action going on at any given moment in time? Like, we're, we're just happy that it got blocked at our gateways, right? Um, and I, I guess from there, the Her Herman mentioned, well, hey, it's two weeks before Black Hat. B-Sides is coming up. Why don't we open source something to the community, right? And why don't we make it such that, well, Everybody can do this, right? It, it's not rocket science. We've kind of hacked together some code. How do we make it so that anybody, like small team of two InfoSec people, can put something together and they can also have a capability that looks something like this? Um, now, initially I thought, yeah, man, that's easy. I submitted the talk for B-Sides. I was like, cool, no, it's easy. Like, I'll, I'll do it like the night before B-Sides. We'll I'll just like create a Git repo, push some code up, and it'll be fine. Um, and like three weeks ago, I was kind of thinking it through when I was thinking about the structure of the presentation. I thought, well, like, what if you don't have Intuzo, right? Or what if you don't have hybrid analysis or wildfire or, like, most of our tooling is kind of very specific to us and what we do, right? 
Like if, if you're a, a two-man shop, you don't have the budget to buy all the tools, and that creates like a whole other set of problems. What do I do for malware analysis? What do I do for case management? What do I do, you know, like how, how do I have the same capability associated with a, with a bank that has like lots of money to spend on InfoSec because they really invested in security as a whole, right? Um, and, and so what I decided to do was, well, geez, man, we're going to rewrite everything from the ground up. Um, and we're going to build it on an open source stack, right? Um, so everything from case management to the, there should be nothing here that you have to pay for specifically. Um, I, I made that decision three weeks ago. Um, two weeks ago, I, I started building infrastructure. Um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So then Thursday and Friday, we were, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we were away at an offsite, so I lost those days to liquor, I think. Um, I can't remember. Um, and then kind of Monday this week, I, I started writing the code for this particular project. Um, I haven't slept much since then. Again, the polish may not be there. There's some bugs, but I'm fairly certain I can iron those out before the end of the week and we can like open source something to, to a Git repo that anybody can download and make some attempt at kind of emulating kind of our, our incident response lifecycle, right? So, um, um, I, I have brought my son along as ritual sacrifice, just in case we don't get on. But, uh, no. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm going to try and do a demo. I, I, w I thought about recording the demo, and then I thought, you know what, guys, come on, man. It's, we're, we're demoing incident response here. It's got to be kind of live demo. Hopefully, please work, please. Um, so I'm, I'm going to do this. I, I must say I made code changes last night. I, I, I don't know. So if it doesn't work, I'm just going to retry the command, and we'll, we'll kind of play around. That should fill us up. So what time, what time do I need to finish? Half past? Cool. I got time. Um, so I'm sure I can push some code changes in between then. Um, let's, let's do this. Okay, I'm just going to leave. Um, I'm going to try and keep the chat history off screen here for some of the other conversations because Someone's going to post something with dirty words in. I know, I know our incident response team. They know I'm presenting. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so anybody who doesn't know, this is a Telegram window. Um, Telegram is like instant mass messaging kind of environment. So think WhatsApp, um, just Russia, I guess. Um, and but basically, so. This Telegram chat, I'm chatting to a particular bot, which I hope is still running. Let me actually just check. Please be running. Um, get disconnected. I don't know if it's up, but we're going we're gonna to make some attempt at making this work. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm assuming I've got a malware sample in here. So I'm just going to drop it in. Um, I don't know if the bot's up. I don't know if it's going to respond. I'm, I may have to reboot it. Just a second, I see my network connectivity died and came back up, so I don't know if it's running. Um, but while I drop in the file, these aren't going to be malware samples because this is my personal machine. I would like it to not have malware on. Um, and also, well, it, I think it's just going to be safer so we don't get like AV issues. But bot, please respond. I've sent you stuff. Please respond. Um, let's see. You, you, can al you can also do this from your phone. So let's just see. Um, no, I think it's died. Let me just do a quick reboot. Um, okay. Sorry, just one second. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, my net. I, I've actually got it running in a terminal window and my network's died and I should have run this in screen, but, you know, benefit of hindsight. Um, I think the network's up. Let's do a thing. Send it a file. Please bot respond to my files. Um, ah, come on. Craig, stop it. Ah, okay. 
stop it. Um, okay, cool. Uh, so the bot will respond and kind of just respond with a file hash acknowledging that it's received the file. Um, it probably should reply again and just tell me, hey, um, I've already seen this file, so I'm not going to process it for you. Um, so this file has now been indexed. It's, it sits within, uh, within the database for the bot, so it exists. It's, it's readable. It's accessible. Um, and, and now we can kind of do some stuff with it, right? So what I want to do is I'm just going to take this message that it's given me here, and I'm just going to do a virus total lookup. Um, th this version of the bot is quite different to our other one, the, the one that we're running. Um, you have to go command and parameters. This one here is context aware, so you can reply to other messages, and it will kind of tell you, hey, does this exist? Is there context here that I can use? It will attempt to figure that context out and kind of present you with something. Um, so this is some virus total data um, that it's managed to find for this particular sample. You can see, obviously, this one's not malicious. <laughs> yeah, that, that's not a real antivirus. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> um, so you can see I've kind of just done some virus total lookups on that particular hash. Um, I've got another option here. I can either reply to this particular um, MD5 hash or the particular file. Um, so you can do either. Um, I'm going to keep using the hash because I tested that earlier. It still works. Um, and I'm just going to sandbox this particular file. This one takes a little bit of time. Um, while it takes some time to submit to the sandbox and the sandbox to do its own processing. Um, so it was submitted ID 22 to the Cuckoo sandbox. Um, let me actually see if it's running. Please be running. Uh, Please, please network be decent. Um, okay, cool. So we've got the file up there. ID twenty one. Okay, that was the last submission. It should still be running. Let's see. Sorry, the network is not the most amazing thing at present on 3G. If, if there's anyone from Salsi here, it's your guy's fault, right? Um, so, uh, let me see. Yeah, 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 um, you can see the sample is running um, on that side. Hopefully when it's finished processing, the bot will send me a message back saying, hey, Kaku has finished looking at this particular sample. We've got some indicators for you that may be of, uh, of use or not, I don't know. Um, while we wait, um, let's get Telegram back up. Um, we can reply to messages, files, or we can actually just send it commands. I'm, I'm going to try another one here. Um, so I'm going to ask it to disassemble a file, a hash, not the one that I've uploaded now, just kind of to show you how this works. Um, not the first time I've heard that, a but anyway, um, my presentations tend to go well. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, again, this takes some, some time. Um, what I'm going to ask it to do here is um, I'm going to ask it to go and look up that particular hash somewhere, try to find the file, pull down the file. Once you've got the file, it's going to disassemble the file using Rodare. Um, I can see it's been disassembled. Um, it's going to kind of do a code graph of the, dis of the assembly. Um, it's going to convert it to an image and it's going to send it back to me, right? So if you've got malware analysts in your team, hopefully you don't. These guys don't have many personalities. Um, okay, so the Kaku sandboxing has finished. It's kind of said, okay, cool. The Kaku sandbox score is two, so uh, virus total. The one thing that's not an AV did detect it, so I can confirm it looks as we've seen earlier. Um, if I click on this document, um, so this is a disassembly graph that the IDA, the DARE people will love plenty. Um, so you can kind of look at the functions that you see in front of you and say, okay, cool. Is this, ah, why did I scroll? Damn it. Um, Yeah, my, my talks aren't really that good. Don't, don't worry, guys. We're, we're fine. 
Um, so you can kind of look at the disassembly graph and kind of look for things like interesting loops that usually show some that, that the crypto stuff, crypto locker type things use. You know, when you when you encrypt content, you just run through a loop of like streaming in bytes, encrypt bytes, write bytes. Um, so you can ID them pretty quickly if you're into this kind of stuff, which I'm which I'm not. Um, you know. <laughs> Damn it, Craig. Um, the, the other thing I'll, you, you can do here is you can, um, I'm just going to grab some content, Let's just paste in some content so you can see I've got an IP and I've said it is an IP and I've put in another IP which is also tagged as data type IP. Um, so you can delimit these by comma, space, carriage return line feeds, the bot tries to assume you're not going to follow instructions. So it will, it will try and figure out whatever you sent it, right? Um, so over there I've got some indicators of compromise, um, just two IPs for this particular purpose. Um, and I'm going to ask it to do a threat lookup. Uh, so what I've done for the threat lookup is in the back end I'm using a service called um, HippoCamp, I think. Um, and essentially what I'm doing here is I'm just going to throw those at it and say, okay, look through all the open source data feeds that's available at any given time and just give me reputation information for whatever IOCs I've sent you. Um, so you can do some domain and a domain name, some IP. All, all you've got to do is just tag your data. Um, should have replied by now. There, something wrong with my indicators. No, something wrong with your indicators. It's, um, sorry, I need to reply to a message. Um, yeah, it, it kind of doesn't like my context. There, there was no context that it couldn't figure it out. I thought I was stupid. Um, so anyway, I'm now going to try and look it up. Okay, cool stuff. Happy days. Um, for indicator 1.1.1, .1 I found nothing. Um, for indicator 2.2.3, etc., IPs, I've got a threat score, and it's actually being tracked on um, the Fido tracker abuse.ch block list, right? Um, so if, if you're doing incident response, and like for anybody who does standby, particular standby incident response, what ends up happening is you usually get some alarm that goes off like some stupid hour of the morning <laughs> when you're sleeping, and then you've got to like boot your laptop up and then wait for the VPN and the freaking hamsters and their wheels to do a thing. Um, and kind of what we've done here is that we've allowed our IR teams to be able to do this kind of stuff without getting out of bed. And if an, if an alarm does trigger, like for example this one here, hey I found this indicator here, assuming this was triggered, the original source was something that did detonate. Your incident response guy knows, okay, now I need to really get out of bed and like open up my laptop screen. Whereas assuming they found nothing here, like he can go straight back to bed and hopefully get some sleep. Because you want him in work the next morning so he can actually clean up the mess that was made last night when he was sleeping, right? Um, but let's assume that now your threat analyst has looked at this data, realized, well, this is maybe not the best thing in the world that's happened to us. Um, let's go back to my messaging platform. I need to get back out of bed, so he's going to do that, but I actually need to start working on this particular case, right? So what I'm doing here is I'm using a particular tool, also open source, called the Hive. It's case management for security incident response. Um, and what I've done is I've just told it, hey, um, do some the Hive stuff, create a case called B-Sides, new case. There's some indicators of compromise. When I get to my PC and it boots up and the VPN gods have done their thing, which seldom happens anyway, um, like I, I want to be ready to work on this particular incident, right? So you can see here it's supposedly done some things, which I, I don't know. But again, prayers to the, to the demo gods. Um, refresh. Um, so just wait. I think I'm not logged in. Yeah, I'm not logged in. <laughs> if you can see by the last cases that went into this thing here, I was actually still debugging code quite late last night. 
Um, so anyway, you can see over here, we've created a case. Um, we've called it B-Sides New Case something. Is that the name? Oh, no, I've created two. Um, well, you can see over here, a minute ago, we've created the case. We've added the IOCs. Everything is kind of context aware there. Um, we can add tags if we want, but I, I didn't want to test it just in case it failed. Um, let's kind of see here. We can also add tasks from here, so we can kind of say, hey, this was a malware sample, and we can create predefined malware sample tasks that your IR person will have to complete before the, the case is closed in, in your automation system. Um, but if we just go observables, um, these are the IOCs. Um, you can see there are two IOCs, so I'm going to click on this one. Um, and then I'm just going to tell it to do all the magic things, right? Um, so what's happened here is in this, the Hive tool, what I've done is I've actually connected it to the Hippocamp threat indicator, threat lookup thing. Um, and it uses another tool called Cortex, which is responsible for kind of taking out all of the tasks in this particular IOC and doing some analysis on it. So you can see I'm um, kind of the four tasks that I run here. I've got the virus total report for that IP. Um, I've looked it up on Alien Vault's Open Thread Exchange, and I've looked it up within Hippocamp. Um, and kind of to see what that data returns. So far, we're still waiting for Alien Vault to open Thread Exchange. Cool. We've got some stuff. Um, and if you look at the top of the screen, somewhere up yonder, you can see we, we've got thread scores of 86.02 in terms of negative. We've got some virus total data and OD, o, Alien Vault open threat exchange pulses. It's appeared in nine different pulses. So this IP has been tagged by nine different thread actors, right? Um, so you can pull out that content. Um, you can actually look at the reports if you do a thing. Where's the reports button? Um, I don't know where it is now. I can't see the screen. Um, anyway, you can, you can pull down the reports for each of those items. Um, you can read them, and then you can decide, OK, cool, the fact that AV's blocked this, is that good? Is it bad? Do I need to knack the machine? Um, and, and usually what you do is you just isolate that machine so it can't talk to anything in the world, and then you go back to sleep, right? Because now you've done something, and in the morning you can do something better. So uh, essentially what you've done here is you've taken a process of a lot of manual steps, right? And per usually what happens is every time there's an alarm, you need to run through like a million different steps, right? Fire marshal, like call security, are we fine? Can we stay in the conference facility? Like, you know, um, and, and you don't even know if it's a real alarm yet, right? Um, whereas what this allows us to do is just kind of click all the buttons, wait for some data to come back and say, yeah, you know what, actually I can go back to sleep. I don't actually have to disturb the speaker while he's speaking. People in the front row. <laughs> just kidding, <laughs> okay. Um, and, and I, and I think this is one of the things that allowed us to achieve our, our targets as an incident response team. Obviously, we run something completely different to what appears here, but we, we, we've open sourced this. So pretty much anybody should be able to achieve something similar. So in the interest of time, I'm going to go a little bit quick. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so aut automate plenty. It, it, it doesn't cost all, all the monies. Um, I, I want to go back to this thing here because, you know, guys, product, vendors, like, it doesn't matter, right? If, if, if you take away one thing from this is that, like, the R&D time that we put into red teaming stuff, finding exploits, finding vulnerabilities, um, logos and cool names for exploits and vulnerabilities and bug bounty, like, the, the blue team need to have the same kind of stuff, right? And it doesn't matter what product you buy, there isn't a product on the market at the moment, as far as I'm concerned, that you could put down, look at the lights on the front panel, make sure they're all green, and then say, okay, cool, I've done my job, and go away, right? The product lives don't matter. It's, it's the people's lives that matter. It's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the time that goes into making all of these things come together. Um, more, more boosters for anybody who's a Kerbal Space Program fan. Um, like wh when in doubt, more, more boosters. Um, and 
I, I guess this one here is another, another thing I want to emphasize is that you, you guys have all heard about the defender's dilemma, right? A and the defender's dilemma is that, you know what? You, you can do everything right barring that one thing. And that's the thing the attacker finds and exploits and kind of gives your team a bad name, right? But actually what you can do here is you can turn this into the attacker's dilemma. Now, we had a targeted attack simulation that was carried out against us and we managed to find some of the guys that kind of made a slip up in terms of where they were sending email from. Um, they, they were sending us mail with malware and malicious payloads. Um, and they made a slip up in how they configured their mail environment. So what happens is they didn't know, but once we pulled that header, um, we were able to search through all of our mail logs and find infrastructure that they hadn't used yet. Um, that they were planning to use much later in their attack simulation. Um, but we proactively nuked all the things and we made sure we responded to nothing. So when they were kind of figure out, okay, does this exploit land? Does this bypass AV? Can we get through the mail gateway? Like the, 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 IR, the red teaming guys were kind of frustrated at some point and they kind of closed out our engagement with... We got to a point where we weren't sure what was happening. Like we started this off and we were getting responses back. And then afterward we kind of got confused because there was stuff that we knew should land, but it didn't for a reason we didn't understand. Um, and this is the attacker's dilemma, right? Because the attacker has to slip up once. And if you're smart and you can kind of tie all these things together very quickly, what you can do is you can turn that into the attacker's dilemma, right? You, you can go and look up the history of a particular IP, look at the domain names that are returned and go, eh, maybe, may mm -mm. and then kind of turn off all this infrastructure. Um, and, you know, like, info, your, the stuff that you build kind of needs to be fit for purpose, right? That's why you won't see me in skinny jeans, right? I try to be fit for purpose, you know, f build for the body type. Um, can you use this thing today? I would highly likely recommend Maybe no. Just give me a week <laughs> just to sort out the bugs and stuff and the, th and the things. Um, and, and there are some, some fundamental things I'd like to change. So like maybe going from a SQLite 3 backend to maybe like a Mongo database, which is better suited for throwing in files and heaps of unstructured data. As you can see, the, the chat integration with a bot is like lots of unstructured comms. Um, so SQLite 3 is a little bit painful compared to MongoDB in that regard. Um, and then, uh, sorry, I've, thro I've thrown this in there because the, the author of our original bot, um, the, the one we're using now in its first iteration before I started looking after it, was this guy, um, James. Um, but you know, <laughs> I'll let it do its own thing. Any, anyway, I've, I've, I've watched that video way too many times. That, that was <laughs> just, um, but you, you know, like, like take on tasks that are outside of your scope, you know, like outside of your comfort realms. Like put R&D back into the blue team, you know. Um, R&D is not just for the red team. We don't just need like 30% of red teaming teams doing like their, their working hours devoted to research. Like why can't the blue teams also have research time? You know, that, I, I think that's really the critical difference between saying, hey, we're going to just tick all the audit boxes versus, you know what, we're going to make some attempt at defending our environment. Um, yeah, and then questions. I'm going to ask you to speak loud because I'm, I'm not going to run up and send the mic. So, so I, think, I think for us, the trust issues were sorted out relatively quickly because what we did is we said, okay, guys, we're going to send you IOCs and you're going to block them on the firewall and then we send them lots of them. 
And then we also say, also, you have a few minutes to get these done. And if something goes pear-shaped, it's, it's your soft and tenders on the chopping block, right? Um, now, now, if you know IT people, you know that nobody wants the accountability and the ownership of the problem. They all just want the benefit of the doubt that the thing is working. So I think the minute you move accountability to them and they push back on that, then, I mean, kind of your, your problem solves itself, right? Either they set to manage this particular task, and if they are, then your bot just needs to be able to send them work and let them do their work. A and we started doing that with a lot of the things. We, we all started off with, um, for every component we built into our bot, it started off with emails that go to like a address list. Hey, address list, block this thing on Mimecast. Hey, address list, here's more stuff. And then people kind of realized, this is, this is more work than I wanted to do, you know? And, and that, that, that's worked for us, but I mean, again, fit for purpose and what, what, what works in your team. Uh, thanks, sorry, this is, um, I'm just, because I'm curious. Um, so I understand that the fintech companies kind of now share information, security information. I was just wondering, do, did you know uh, what caused the Liberty hack and w what they did wrong? And, uh, you know, I'm just curious, like, you know, if you know anything. Uh, um, I, I, I actually can't share it with you, but uh, at the moment, it could be because of like non-disclosure things, and it also could be because Liberty don't know, and it could be because they didn't share the information, and it could be a lot of things, but good question. <laughs> no more questions? Okay, cool. This is proof that talking fast. Oh, damn it, the one guy. <laughs> but, So, <laughs> so I'm just wondering. So, it seems SA banks are sharing information on malware and all that. How's that linking in with the rest of the world? Because I'm sure there's large sections of people that. Is it, and and what what benefit is there to specifically SA banks working together on this? I mean, has been there for a long time, right? Um, so that's been an effort on its own, and we all kind of were like in the same group of people here. The, the other thing is that targets facing South African banks are very much unlike targets facing international banks, a and that, that is mostly because of our customer base, right? I, I mean, it's not a secret that in South Africa, education levels are much lower than they are in other develop, uh, developed countries. And we, it also means that we very have a very susceptible population base. I, in terms of the targets, the targeted attacks that we get as, as banks, uh, I can tell you that they, they exceed what happens globally. That's to our customer base, as well as attacks that hit our infrastructure. Um, so far this year, Craig will correct me if I'm wrong, but we've seen two attacks hit us that, like, we were the first people to put this malware sample on VirusTotal, right? Um, Okay, he said more than more than that. I, I only like listen to them as seldom as I when they complain when they complain that something in the bot's not working all, all the time. Yeah, okay. Um, but very often, what happens is we we put malware samples um, on the internet that other organizations globally just haven't seen yet. Um, and very often, from our uh, some of our third-party providers that give us threat intelligence, it can be like three to like five days later, we get an email from them saying, hey guys, look out for this thing that we've seen. Here's some stuff. And we're like, guy, no, close and delete. Um, and I think that's because we respond to every malware sample that hits our email gateway, right? Um, but but we, our, our landscape is very different from what it is globally. Um, also, just keep in mind that in the developing countries kind of space, um, so let, I'll, I'll just take BRICS nations. 
is that where you have companies who appear to not be at the top of their game from an infosec space, and they're banks that hold lots of money, international fraud syndicates are going to look at you first, right? You've got two choices. I mean, you can go after something that's under jurisdiction from the NSA, or there's this South Africa that doesn't have crime intelligence in terms of response and prosecution. So if you look at global targets, we're, we're like way up there. Okay, cool. So I'm told we have more time for questions. I'll, I'll do the Jerry Springer thing for you and come on over to the crowd. <laughs> uh, cool. So my question is um, a bit simple. Um, uh, correct me if I'm mistaken. So I, I hear that you put more emphasis on emails. Is there a reason why you speak more on emails? or? Yeah, we we don't put just more emphasis on emails, but email tends to be the highest payload delivery mechanism. Um, so for example, I, I know in other organizations I've worked when antivirus kind of pops up and says, hey, I've blocked a piece of malware, that's kind of the end of the in investigation for them, it's a handled threat as, as they regard it. Um, for us, when every single AV alert, if Cylons tells us it's seen something we're going to go and look into the bowels of that and determine where did it come from, how did how did it get there in the first place, and what what control failed to get us to that point. Um, to to give you an idea, um, CSV sandboxing in Mimecast wasn't a thing for almost three months after we like kind of said, guys, look look at the things that are that are landing. Uh, no, sorry, I lied. Three weeks, uh, not three months. Um, on the Mimecast side. And the Mimecast R&D guys, like I, I must say, they, they came to the party, but they had to figure out how do we sandbox a plain text file, right? Wh which is a little bit more complicated than it would first seem. Um, IQY file types, like when those became a thing, MS settings, dash, dash, dash configs, and like all bunch of different file types that people have used for delivering payloads. Like we, we look at it and decide, how, how did this piece of malware get here in the first place? We have EDR, which is Endpoint Detection Response. We look at the full command line history that's appeared on that particular machine, processes created in the whole stack, and determine how did this piece of malware get here and what do we do to make sure that control doesn't fail next time? So it's not just email, but for the purposes of the demo, it's kind of easier to show it in the form of email. just goes along with I think it's important to note that it, it, it obviously it happens like now email is the most common attack vector and that's why we spend a lot of time on that but I mean in six months time it might change and might go somewhere else and that's obviously where we'll focus most of our energy but um, at the current moment most of our time is email because that's the most easiest way to get into the bank cool okay can, can we take one more question you think we'll have time Okay, okay. Um, you'll find me in the hallway and we can ask lots of questions. Sir. Cool. Uh, thank you very much, Kellen. That was very good. Um, sorry about the alarm. First uh, construction, there was construction on the first floor that kicked it off. We had to get the building manager to set it off. I mean, turn it off. Um, we're taking a 10 minute break. Uh, next talk starting at half past. See you then.